Welcome to Season 8, Episode 34 of the Ubuntu Podcast. In this episode, we're going to be discussing Mark's new Steam controller. (laughs) We'll also have some command line love. And we'll go over your feedback. Um, I'm Martin, and joining me this week are Laura. Hi, uh, starting to feel a bit uncomfortable. (laughs) (laughs) And Alan. Hello, hello. And the owner of the Steam Controller, Mark. Is that my, how people are going to introduce me now? Yeah, yes. I'm going to get you a Developer t-shirt, and t-shirt owner. printed and everything. Yeah. <laughs> <Whoops>. <laughs> at least you can code. Oh yeah, at least I can code. So Mark, what have you been up to? Uh, I've been uh, cooking poppadoms. I found, <laughs> I found out this, uh, this week. two that, weeks. Yeah, that's all I've been doing. Now I found out this week that if you buy poppadoms. uncooked poppadoms from the supermarket, instead of having to fry them, and getting them covered in oil and fat and then waiting for them to dry off before you can eat them, you can just stick them in the microwave. Mm. What? I know. Yeah. Do you, do you, don't they cook unevenly so you end up with, like, uncooked No, not or... really. No, if, as long as you do them no, for long fine. enough. Don't do them in one go. And do you have to spray them with no, oil or something? Just put them or... on a plate, put them in for about a minute, depending on your microwave. Individually? Individually. Yep. And they puff up. I sometimes this do is a revolution. A <laughs> and they come out and they're really crispy and nice. Wow. Yep. I thought everyone knew no, this. I'd know okay. No, I'm stunned inside. I usually fry them and then they're just a mess because yeah. they curl yeah. up and they wrap around the like fish slice <laughs> thing that I'm trying to push them down with, and it's just a disaster. But that's a brilliant oh. image. And I've oh. been doing that for like 20 years. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. <Slow> down, yeah. <laughs> so, Alan, what have you been up to? Not cooking Papa Dog. That's what <laughs> I've been doing. <laughs> um, I've been using something called Twine. Um, I I've, I played with this a long time ago, and uh, like I recently discovered that it's got a um, a web version and a free software version. The version two that is now out is available for Windows, Mac, and Linux, and that you can use it in the web as well. Okay. And it's a a thing that's used for creating interactive stories. Ooh. So you can use, create interactive fiction, like a like um, you know you are stood in a forest, click here to go oh, north, wow. click oh, here cool. to go west, that kind of thing. But it's really stupidly easy to use. It's got like a a graphical representation of each location with little arrows pointing to the next one. Sweet. So you can see like a visual representation of your 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 play area, right? So wow. it's usually used for games, but I've been using it for walking you through uh, problem diagnosis <laughs> um, because one of the problems uh, with um, like say for example, Ubuntu upgrades is sometimes they fail and for a new user, it's very difficult for them to understand what's gone wrong and how to fix it Mm -hmm. and it's also hard for the person supporting them to debug what's gone wrong and how to fix it and so i started creating this little adventure where you you press buttons on you know is your screen black and is there a flashing cursor and do you get the desktop and you know do your icons appear and all that kind of stuff and you walk them through and then eventually get to the end of the game and the end of the game is here's the solution to fix your problem you know that kind of thing and it could be used for anything but I had a play with that, and I wrote a blog post about it. We'll link to it in the show notes. Ooh. So that's what I've been doing. Cool. Laura? Uh, I was hacking dinosaurs on the Isle of Wight. What? I know. With a big knife? Yes. No. Was this at Black Gang Chine? It was. So Black Gang Chine's a, quite an old uh, amusement park at the south point of uh, the Isle of Wight, and they have in one area a display where they have mechanical dinosaurs, which in itself is actually pretty good. Um and we got to have a go around it. But one of the things we did found last year was um, we did actually interview Lucy Rogers a few we did. We did, yes. months ago about this, I think. Um, so last yeah. year, the T-Rex broke down and the parts had to come from China. So they hacked a Raspberry Pi into it. And so it had a Raspberry Pi controlling this T-Rex. Um, and then gradually since then, over the past year, ever since every time one of the dinosaurs broke down, instead of getting it with the official parts, they replaced it with a Raspberry Pi. Nice. Um, <laughs> And so this was the third time, the third six-month hackathon um, that they've been sort of trying to, both getting ideas, but also just trying to implement it better and things. Um, So I was invited to go along. Um, I didn't actually get as far as hacking any dinosaurs, but I did learn a bit of JavaScript and how to use Node Red. Oh. Awesome. Yeah. How about you, Martin? What have you been up to? I have been to the Egham Raspberry Jam. I think it was the 9th or something, Tasty. or the 11th. Or 
Oh, yes, delicious. It was really good. It was, uh, there was some competitions running this time, uh, an under 16s category and an over 16s category. I'm sorry, but the over 16s category, I can't remember who the winner was, but it, I'm sure it was fascinating. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, the under 16 winner was a lad called Josh, who's 14, who had printed a multitude of things, including a gauntlet. Oh. All of the individual segments that then oh, no connected way. together to make a fully, you know, flexing wow. uh, That's awesome. gauntlet. But not only that, the printer that he was using was proprietary and didn't have Linux drivers until he wrote oh, a Linux man. kernel driver for <laughs> it. <laughs> so consequently, I think he got all the votes in the under <laughs> yeah. 16 category. I feel not suddenly just, very inadequate. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> he, this 14 he year was, old kid. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. He was, he was uh, uh, a, a really bright young man. Uh, a pleasure to meet. Wow. And um, and then off the back of that, um, I've done the release for Ubuntu Mate fifteen ten, and then specifically uh, the yeah, thank <laughs> you the uh, the Raspberry Pi two version, where I spoke to a number of people at the Raspberry Pi Jam and have on subsequent visits about uh, their experiences with it and getting their feedback and. Cool using their feedback to improve the n- new version so yeah awesome Excellent. right should we get on with it Let's. right i'm going to talk a bit about the steam controller What's a Steam controller, Mark? <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> so the Steam controller is um, uh, a gamepad like uh, you... What's that, Mark? What's a gamepad? <laughs> well, okay, this is going to get old quickly, box. isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> a controller like you use for a uh, games console or like you can get for PCs in various Like devices. an Xbox type Xbox controller, controller GameCube right. controller, PlayStation controller, that kind of thing. Um, but this is a new one released uh, by Valve, who make the Steam platform and some games... Um, which has been released to coincide with their Steam machines and Steam Link hardware. Um, they were made available for pre-order a few months ago, um, and they go on general sale, I think, on the 10th of November. And the pre-order unit arrived at the end of last week. So oh. the I- the idea is that um, up until now, if you wanted to have a PC-based gaming platform to plug into your TV and have in your living room... Um, you were kind of limited as to what games you could really play because PC games generally tend to be designed with uh, mouse and keyboard in mind, not with a controller. Um, Now they've been increasingly going towards controller support, but some just, they rely on having a mouse pointer on the screen and you can't really do that um, with a controller and have good, accurate control. Um, I've tried doing it with a Wii remote, but your arm gets really tired. Uh, it's been the case for for years yeah. that games that require you to point at things, you know, like I remember, <laughs> I remember SimCity being ported to the Sinclair Spectrum, the original, yeah. or something like that, and you have to use cursor keys yeah. to move a pointer, and it just doesn't work very yeah. well. So how do they, how do they solve that on this controller? Well, there's there's various things on the controller which are kind of um, it's like a best of of all the controllers that have ever existed. So you've got bits which are kind of like an Xbox controller, bits that are kind of like a GameCube controller. But the the real USP is that instead of having two analog sticks, which pretty much every controller for the past 10 years, except for the Wii, has had, is that um, it's got two um, touchpads, kind of like you get on a laptop, um, and they go under your thumbs. One... Um, is sort of has um, a sort of uh, embedded shape of a D-pad and the other one is just flat, but both of them are complete touch pads, which you can use both at once. Um, And they're also... So you can slide your fingers, your your, your 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 thumbs all across them. Um, So you can use one of them as a mouse cursor, for example, um, or more. I'll come to that in a bit, in a minute. And they're also both clickable. Um, which is kind of funny. It takes a bit of getting used to, but yeah, kind of like you have clickable touchpads, although it feels a so, bit different. A couple of questions yeah. on that. W- what's the sensitivity like, you know, the range of control that you've got um, on that? And when you say they're clickable, just one section's clickable? No, or the whole pad clickable clicks bits? down. Right. Um, so um, 
it can be you can have two you can have it where it'll only activate when you click it down or it'll activate when you touch and when you click it down or it only activates on touch um uh and the sensitivity is adjustable depending on the game and on the style of control so um the um the idea is that for each game because each game is controlled in a different way you can set up a different controller profile and that means that these touchpads can be set up to be something else so they can be an analog stick or they can be a mouse or they can be a trackball or whatever it is that gives you the best control for that game so so you you don't just like plug it in and and away you go like you would with like a key i mean with a, even with a keyboard you might redefine the keys yeah. or whatever to what you're most familiar with but you you kind of have to go through that process for the controller for every game kind of it depends on the game um so yeah there's a bit of basic setup to do at the beginning um you get a dongle you plug it in you turn your controller on it connects to steam um it updates the firmware if it needs to um there is a bit of extra stuff you need to do on ubuntu at the moment so i'm going to write a blog post which will I'll publish at the same time this show comes out if anyone's wondering what you have to do. Once you know what to do, it takes about five minutes, but I was there for about 24 hours working out what was going on. Um, on on that point, yes. um, in the Ubuntu 15.10 release notes, there's one line that simply reads, full support for the Steam controller out of the box. Ah, so Ubuntu 15.10 onward, uh, you won't have any of those shenanigans. Right fantastic and they might well backport it to yeah to other releases yeah. as well so if you wait it may well be yeah it does just need i think it just needs the steam package to be updated yeah. um and yeah it'll work um so then when you play a game um you do it in steam big picture mode which is their 10 foot interface which fills the whole screen and is easily controllable with a control pad uh, you go to the game which you want to play and you get um if it's got controller support anyway, you can just go in and play it. And basically then the controller emulates an Xbox 360 controller, which is the standard controller that, that PC games will support. And it's got all the same buttons in more or less the same places. And in that case, you use one analog stick as an analog stick and use the uh, one of the pads as another analog stick. Um, if it doesn't support controllers, you've got several options. Um, you can use one of their sort of preset templates so they have this uh, gamepad template they have a thing called gamepad with precision aim where the um it's exactly like the gamepad except for the right pad um is more like a trackball in terms of how it controls the cursor or the camera um and then if they don't if it doesn't support gamepads at all it will map to a mouse and keyboard the wasd keys for moving around um, and the mouse for looking around, and then the buttons will bind to the sort of standard hotkeys for first-person games. Um, however, if none of those are suitable, you can either customize it completely, or you can, and that includes things like sensitivity, and you can use a button as a modifier for other buttons, so they can have more than one function. But also, there's community setups where you can see what other people have set theirs up as or like oh, right. so the developers could have That's a recommended nice. setup for you which you can just apply and then go and play so is and, it fairly straightforward for you to like browse those like communities are they community are they rated or so can you tell whether someone's community config is a good one there isn't a rating yet um i suspect that might come along soon um at the moment you just have to sort of look at them and see which one you think is going to work for you or try them out quickly. Because the other thing is you can change them in game as well. Um, if you press the steam button in the middle of the controller, it brings up an overlay and you can change the controls in game. Oh, nice. Yeah. And, and um, how have you found that compatibility, you know, sort of using it as an emulated Xbox 360 controller in games that only support the Xbox 360 controller? Um, I've tried it with, hold on. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've tried it with eight different games, some of which have controller support, some of which don't, and it works brilliantly in all of them. Oh, well, that's an wow. endorsement yes. then, isn't it? Um, so um, I'll skip ahead a bit. I'll just talk about some of the games I've played. So um, I've played a first-person shooter game where it recommends that you use this precision aim um, with all of the other buttons as just normal uh, touchpad controls. That works really well. Um, 
it t- takes a bit of getting used to because your aim is more sensitive than you're used to if you've used the control pad but if you're used to using a mouse it's as sensitive so it makes a lot more sense um i've played some games which rely on having a cursor so i've played um a real-time strategy and a point and click adventure um and an isometric rpg um where so in a game in a game like i don't know like minecraft yeah. or whatever you'd use where on a keyboard and mouse you'd use wasd yes. for for moving around and you'd use the mouse for looking yes. Would you use the left stick, like the proper stick, for walking around and the touchpad for looking? Exactly, yes. And that's that's one oh. of the predefined setups. And then you just customize the other buttons to the key bindings, which right, you to all use the other for. Things. Yeah, right. so you, one could be, your, it can be your mouse wheel and it can be a, you know, uh, yeah, open your inventory, close your inventory, open your crafting menu, that kind of thing. Did any um, of the games not work particularly well? Any, any of them you had problems with? No, I've not found one where it doesn't i mean the the um the only slight problem with keyboard and mouse games is you've got a limited number of buttons on the controller so you can only have so many key bindings but it does kind of get around that because you've got these two um on the on the handles you have two buttons which are under your um your li- two little fingers um so uh you can configure it so that those act like modifiers so if you you've got your four a b x y buttons on the front you could have it so that they do one thing when you're not using either of the grip buttons one thing when you you're also holding the left grip and one thing when you're also holding the right grip which gives you 12 instead of four right and um whilst you've had good success yeah have you had to invest much time in getting them set up right has there been much tinkering uh there's been a bit of tinkering i mean i always end up doing a bit of tinkering um with games with control setups um usually the first sort of couple of days of when i get a new game i'm sort of tweaking things here and there but then once it's set up i'm good to go so i've not really played enough with any of them to have a complete tinker with it all but i mean some of the games where you just use the controller set up it's fine anyway so would you uh, are they you said there's a dongle yeah uh and um that can just plug into a normal pc and uh, does the controller have rechargeable batteries or is it recharging uh, by a mini it comes USB or it something? comes with batteries um you can also take rechargeable batteries and it can plug in via a micro usb cable i don't know if it can charge via usb as well i've not tried that yet um okay yeah and you also mentioned the the Steam Link. Yes. Uh, does do you have you ordered one of those or not? No, yet? because I've got a I've got a full Steam box under my TV, so I don't really have the need for a Steam Link. Right. Interesting. Yeah. So, the, from from my perspective, it's interesting to me because I've my my PC, my main PC, yeah. is outside the lounge, mm-hmm. and I'd quite like something in the lounge to be able to play with the games that are on my PC. And you know, I don't want to hulk a keyboard into the lounge yeah. or anything stupid like that. And I was thinking maybe a Steam Link and a Steam Controller yeah. would be a good way to stream games from my desktop that's in the other room. Yeah. That sounds like a good a good idea as far as I'm concerned with my experience. I tell you what, one other thing which is which is really cool um is um it gives you tactile feedback on the analog controls and on the touch pads which is really kind of hard to explain unless you've done it so you've got an analog stick and two analog shoulder buttons and you can configure it so that when they go past a certain threshold it gives you a little bit of like haptic feedback a little sort of clunk as you go over a threshold um at which point it activates so if it's if it's like um you know turn left uh, move left move right you can have it so that there's a bit of a dead zone in the middle when once you go over this point it starts to move and similarly the touch pads um as you move your thumb across them they give you a bit of um feedback which kind of makes it feel like you're using um a scroll wheel or a touch bo- uh what's well, a trackball right so it's like giving you feedback as if you had a physical yes. button there but it's not a physical button yes. it's just a donk from inside yeah. the controller nice yeah. and it doesn't always do it it's configurable depending on your controller setup but it's just a really nice little thing and it makes a just like a, a subtle but obvious noise when it does it as well so it feels like you're doing something mechanical even when it's just a, a threshold so before you had this, what controller or control system did you use? So I used a combination of um, originally I used a Wii, contr- uh, sorry, a GameCube controller, 
which was good because I really like the GameCube controller, except it only has um, one shoulder bumper, so it makes it difficult because you don't have enough buttons for what your game is expecting. I then went to a Xbox 360 controller for games with controller support, um, and I've also used a Wii controller for games where you need a pointer. Um, and for games where neither of those will do, I've got a little um, keyboard and with a touchpad built in, which connects over a um, wireless dongle, um, which is okay for some games, but really isn't ideal. So, so the key question then is, is yeah. would you drop all of those for this controller? I already have. Oh, I've oh, literally got no reason to is... use any of the other controllers now. Well, that's achievement unlocked from Valve yeah. then, isn't it? That was the yeah, whole point, yes, exactly. wasn't it? I mean, it says, endorsement. Yeah, it says on the box, play any of your PC games from your couch with the with the Steam controller, and that's exactly what they've done. I've not had, I've not yet seen anything that makes me think they've not done exactly what they wanted to do. So availability, this was, you got yours on a pre-order yeah. that arrived last Friday. Yeah. Are they going to be available in stores or only available online? No, I think or they're what? going to be available in um, game, I believe. Um, I don't know what in the UK. In the UK, I don't know which other shops or uh, in other countries, but yeah, they'll also be available from the Steam store. And how much did you pay for yours to give us an indication? Uh, of what I believe it was forty pounds, and I think that's okay. the retail price, which is comparable to other controllers. If you buy an official um, controller for a games console, that's the amount you tend to pay. So certainly cheaper than having five other ones. Oh yeah, abs- <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes. So the key metric I'm going to look for is how soon am I going to start seeing these in CEX and other second-hand mm. shops, or are people just going to keep mm. hold of them because they're that yeah. good? I'll tell you what, I'm probably going to bring mine to OddCamp and maybe do a, a, a little demo Brilliant. of it for a talk. Cool. Excellent. Uh, if anyone okay, wants to well, see and feel what it's like, as long as you wash your hands beforehand, I don't want sticky <laughs> fingers. <laughs> well, you could bring some latex gloves, Mark, if you're going to get really hygienic. No velvet it. gloves. Don't leave any dead food on it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, not the dead food again. Should we move on? <laughs> yes, let's. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Oh, am I doing Command Line Love as well? Yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry. That's what it says. <laughs> okay. Well, in that case, it's time for some Command Line Love. <laughs> and this week, okay. uh, we have one from Roger Light. He says, I might have mentioned my Command Line Love before, but it's so good and goes hand in hand with the Control R and the like that you were talking about. Bang dollar on the command line means the final item from the previous command line, which is something that comes up lots and lots. I use it every day. For example, make DIR, Bob, CD, bang dollar. That's pretty trivial, but once you start using it, you'll use it all the time. This is brilliant. I've never heard well, a great this. little time saver. Neither have I. Yeah. Isn't yeah. it amazing? You sit in front of this stuff for years and years and years, and then you're still learning. Yeah, it's like learning how to microwave poppadom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I tell you what, they thank you. Ro- they had some great ones on um, on Linux Unplugged the other week. Poppadoms? No, not poppadoms. <laughs> Command line <laughs> hints. Yeah. Um, oh, the Encurses. And stuff. yeah, they were talking about Encurses, uh, Encurses apps, um, and there was some really cool stuff that came up on there. Pipe cut sounds amazing. I still need to check that out. Oh, all right. Let's uh, let's move on. Thank you very much to uh, Roger for that awesome little tidbit. We love getting your feedback, so please send it to us. Even the pointlessly mean stuff makes us laugh a little bit. If it's short, tweet us on at Ubuntu Podcast. If it's less short, but please no essays, email us on show at ubuntupodcast.org. Or you can leave a comment on the relevant show notes on our website, ubuntupodcast.org. And now it's time for all that feedback you've sent him. Uh, so Chris Amos in Ottawa, Canada emailed in response to our discussion about the podcasts we listen to. 
He says, I found the Jupiter Broadcasting Network, sorry, Jupiter Broadcasting Network about four and a half years ago. Since then, I've been an avid consumer of TechSnap, BSD Now, The Faux Show, Tech Talk Today, Linux Action Show, and Linux Unplugged. Golly, that's a lot of shows. Mm. Linux Unplugged is where I first heard Alan and Martin. Hey! And (laughs) and subsequently followed them back to the Ubuntu podcast. They always come back. Uh, Listening to all (laughs) of you has now sucked me far into the Linux world. While I'm still mainly a Windows sysadmin and and gamer three out of my five family pcs have now been installed with martin's product that shall not be named uh well it's a bit late now it's already been <laughs> uh, yeah it's release day i'm allowed yes uh <laughs> and there'll, there'll be some excuse next time as well mm. uh i he also listens to and he gives a list mm. i think we should add these to the show notes yes. as well yeah. there's a few uh there's a few interesting ones that I'd never heard of, uh, mostly yeah. from Canada land. Uh, and uh, yeah, we'll put links to those in the show notes. Thank you very much, Chris. Taryn Dial also emailed us on show at UbuntuPodcast.org to tell us his top three podcasts. Number one, Ubuntu Podcast. Number two, well, of course, Yay. Mintcast. Number three, mm. Linux Luddites. All mm. excellent choices. Thank <laughs> you, totally good. And Nadri Magster left a comment on our website which is of course ubuntupodcast.org Karen Sandler and Bradley M. Kuhn have a free as in freedom podcast bearing in mind that the main topics are law and policy it's surprisingly not boring at least to me and we'll have <laughs> to that podcast in the show notes yep. I've never yeah. listened to that one yeah. yeah they're both good they're, they're both good at giving talks yeah. so it's not surprising they're both good at doing podcasts as yeah. well actually. they yes. organize the legal track at fosdem i believe or i think Bradley's yes been yeah i went into a few of their talks yeah. at fosdem and uh bradley's was excellent i i loved his talk uh, it was really good cool ken fallon of hacker public radio podcast left us a comment too and i should say that we love you, Ken. Um, we, <laughs> we, we omitted to list you in our podcast last week, and he was a little bit hurt by oh. this, I think. <laughs> ben Washko from the Linux Link podcast maintains a list of current Linux podcasts over at the linuxlink.net. Hacker Public Radio also has an ongoing series of podcast recommendations, and we'll link to that in the show notes. If any of your listeners are interested in becoming a podcaster themselves, then they're more than welcome to record their own podcast recommendations and post it on Hacker Public Radio. Excellent. Mm, cool. Yeah, great. And David left a comment too. He says, for a good tech podcast, I would recommend Security Now at twit.tv with Steve Gibson. I'm going to mm. bite my tongue. <laughs> yeah, me too. Moving on. <laughs> and harking back to our previous discussion about ad blocking, David also left a message on our website to say. For ad blocking, I'm using Adblock Plus and Ublock Origin. Both work well. I wonder if he's using them both together or... Is he yeah. using them different in separate places? <laughs> is it going to be like uh, those Windows machines yeah. you see that have got like ten different antivirus yeah. packages yeah. and twenty different ad blockers? Yeah, and Tor- yeah, I used to have a friend. Oh, sorry. No, go on. I used to have a friend that installed every firewall he could get on <laughs> Windows, thinking it would make it <laughs> more <to> secure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, Torin emailed about ad blocking too. Uh, in season eight, episode 31, you talked about ad blockers. My favorite for years was Adblock Plus, but I'm now using Ublock Origin by Raymond Hill, not to be confused with Ublock by Chris Adjudi on my second web browser and may well swap completely to Ublock Origin soon. Now, I had a, a bit of, of a back and that. a forth with uh, Torin about this because I'm, I was using Ublock, not Ublock Origin. And as best as I can tell, uBlock Origin is the continuation and the original spirit of the project and is being actively maintained. And uBlock appears to have gone into bit rot. And uh, that seemed to happen when Raymond Hill uh, founded the uBlock Origin project. Uh, so yeah. I've, I'm now switched to uBlock Origin and it works very well indeed. I can highly recommend it. Um. We also discussed backups in a recent show, and David left a comment for us. He says, I use GR Sync to back up a lot of my files to an external hard drive. I also save my most important files in Dropbox, as well as saving them on a USB flash drive and to my netbook. So I have multiple backups of my most important files. This is fairly quick and easy to do, although I shall look in some of the things mentioned in this show. Yeah, I've heard a few people mention GR Sync. Sounds pretty good. Yeah. And Will left a comment on our website. 
I use GNU, STO, and Git for version config files. Hmm. Yeah. Do you know what STO is? I've not seen that. Oh, I've not come across that. Uh, that's just gone in my list of things to research. <laughs> it sounds interesting. Uh, Nadjumad uh, left a comment about smartphone security. The modem inside the smartphone is a whole computer in itself that's running closed proprietary software. It's fully operational without the main CPU or the phone's OS. In many impl implementations, it can read and change main memory content without OS assistance or knowledge and or subvert the kernel's trusted operations. And he links to a video that explains more detail about how this works. And he says it in about, at about 16 minutes and 45 seconds in, uh, the um, video creator has an explanation of what additional hardware they have put into a Neo 900 to alleviate this issue. Uh, and then he goes on to say, technically, uh, you can have a floss modem implementation. However, it's next to impossible to receive blessing for selling, distributing, connecting those. It's almost universally true that the mere act of connecting a non-blessed modem to a network is punishable by law. Hmm. Huh. Right. That was a follow up to uh, our conversation about how um, Edward Snowden released files that said phones can... Yeah, Indeed. be broken up by, yeah, and by we, third parties. Yeah, and we yeah. hinted at the baseband. So we'll include a link to that video in the um, in the show notes. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Ken Fallon left us a super geeky comment about a recent command line love. Thanks for sen said N one P dollar P. I've been looking for something to do this for ages. This will be used daily, right up there with Control R on the list of useful command line tools. And then he gave us a little function which I think prints. Thanks a million. <laughs> <laughs> I was quite impressed. You mean you didn't run this random code from a stranger on the internet? <laughs> it is. It, it, it's code, and it must be open because I could read it, and therefore I can verify what what its intentions. Are. I could read it, and I could even compile it mentally. So I was quite impressed. <laughs> <laughs> you guys need to get out. <laughs> uh, Simon emailed us about our discussion of the recent VW emissions scandal. Whenever the, something like the VW scandal happens, we're quick to shout, open source would have prevented this. But that's not going to be enough. You don't solve a social problem with better technology and more oversight. As long as there's a huge advantage to be gained, cheaters will always find a way and you're just going to be, you're just going to hide their, they're just going to hide their stuff better. Sorry. A car manufacturer could still cheat if the engine control software was open sourced. For example, the hardware could be built to just pretend that it runs open source for software when it actually runs a different version. So we do not only need open source software, but open hardware and the mm. tools necessary to prove that the hardware was actually built to spec and there's no hidden back doors. Mm -hmm. We haven't really achieved that for any computing device on the market. Our phones, laptops, desktops already contain loads of logic blocks where only the manufacturer knows what they're for. And there are most likely logic blocks that we will never know about because you would need a high-tech lab equipment and years of work to find them. The actual solution will be to remove the incentive instead, for example, by banning combustion engines entirely. You can't manipulate the emissions of an electric engine. I was really liking that up until that last sentence. Yeah, I was, I'm not sure about that either, but I can see where he's going with that. Yeah. Paul Carpenter emailed us. I've listened to about seven episodes. You guys have great chemistry. Oh, what about Aww. Laura? <laughs> I thought I included that. I, I don't usually include the ones that go, you're great. Uh, the thousands and thousands of mail. <laughs> yeah, you just don't know what we get. <laughs> that, was, that was the one we got this year. Yeah, so yeah. I included yeah, that one. the first one I've seen. <laughs> um, yeah, but I usually edited out all the longer emails as well. Um, but that one I thought was quite nice because it suggests that the remote recording is working. Yeah. I True. It is. So that was good. Uh, Ridgewing left a comment on our website last show, but we forgot to mention it. Why is there no Ubuntu podcast subreddit? So I created one. Whoop, now there is. Uh, slash our Ubuntu podcast. Yeah. And I went there today or last week. Um, oh, I get so confused. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> Tyler, why I'm this podcast. <laughs> Uh, and I, I have posted something in there. So thank you very much for setting that up for us. Cool. Got in your DeLorean and went back a week and posted yeah, that's right. I, I had back. to go back two days first and then I got in my... <laughs> <laughs> 
Awesome. In fact, Thank one of the things the I'm sort of at the, at the Raspberry Jam was somebody made the, uh, the the time machine from Back to the Future with a Raspberry Pi, which is brilliant. Awesome. The flux capacitor. Uh, not the flux capacitor, the actual time control unit. Oh, oh nice. what with the display? Cool. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's yeah. brilliant. Yeah, and oh, it properly it? worked because I was looking at games from <laughs> and next 1985. Thing you knew you're back in the 80s. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you, everyone, for your feedback. Well, that's all for episode 34. We'll be back next week when we'll have more news, comment and discussion, possibly from Liverpool. Ah. Ooh. Ooh, road trip. Yes. Mm. Yeah, road trip. Oh, golly. Should we record yeah, look it? Out. Are we going oh, to no, record, record stuff out. there? I think so. Or on the road trip yeah. itself? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I would just yeah. like, record constantly and do like video blog updates <gasps> and stuff, yeah. or not. Oh, just have Periscope yeah. on the whole time. Everyone wants that. Everyone wants more of this all the time. No, they don't. <laughs> and on that <laughs> note. That's so right. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.